All right. Well, first of all, thanks everybody for being here. And, uh, you know, obviously the last few years you've heard us talk about lots of the difficulties uh, as EPS and their partners try to address the complex crime and social disorder issues. Uh, I think today, uh, though, is uh, some good progress has been made and, and, and we'll discuss that between uh, myself and Superintendent McIntyre. Uh, in 2023, thanks to stabilized funding, additional investments from different levels of government, and I would really emphasize strength in partnerships, we started seeing uh, returns on our work, reallocating resources, enhancing the focus of areas with significant social disorder and violence, like downtown, Chinatown, and throughout our LRT and transit system. Targeted collaborative approaches like HSOC, our transit teams are producing tangible results in some areas, which we'll talk about today. But I also just want to echo there's still much work to be accomplished, especially when it comes to the amount of violence prevalent on our streets. While our overall crime rate has decreased by 72% uh, in 2023, mostly due to property crimes and social disorder, violent crimes continue uh, to increase. And in particular, the level of violence within a call, as Superintendent McIntyre will show you. Although we only went up 100 and some calls of violence, the level of violence within that uh, call uh, increases our severity, which is something we'll speak about today. Our members are spending excessive amounts of time managing chaos in our community driven by social disorder, open air drug use and encampments, but as always our approach will remain and still is one of empathy and accountability. And we'll also talk about some of the positive signs that we're seeing in 2024 as a result so far. We continue to target violence, repeat offenders relentlessly and push the rest of the social justice system to uphold these individuals at the same level of accountability. There are violent people who belong in jail and we should and should not be on our streets and we should not be afraid to say that. At the same time, the expansion of a human-centered help, uh, our, our uh, centered liaison and partnership program, which we know has helped, our police and crisis team, which we know is packed, are making significant strides to connect to individual support, which is encouraging. And for this one, a big shout out to the provincial government for their enhanced support and funding the navigators that continue to increase as we move forward. This is thanks, uh, as I mentioned, to the province uh, allowed us to hire 27 new navigators, including our diversion and desistance branch, which has nine more coming in from uh, Enoch Cree Nation to work with us uh, to address some of those social issues and connect people to services better. We're seeing significant progress in 2024, as I mentioned a little bit, opening the Navigation and Support Centre, allowing EPS and its partners to respond more quickly to unsafe encampments, while connecting occupants directly to service providers like housing, healthcare, addiction supports, ID, and the list goes on. And again, the results in Q1 continue to trend in a very, very positive direction. There's, to this point, I think we're in about nine weeks of operation, if not just a little bit more, has seen over 1,200 unique individuals come into these services with over 4,000 referrals and connections to services. This is extremely positive for our city. EPS and its partners are pulling on the same rope together now. The initial results are promising. I think we still have work uh, to do in relation to making sure that we have the right resources with the right authorities at the right time to address the particular situations and that will be more work taken on in 2024. These commitments though from all levels of governments, our partners must continue. We have the ability to do more. The statistics and evidence show that when police are in the right places at the right time, we make a difference. You'll see in the graphs that uh, Superintendent McIntyre uh, uh, will show you. If you look at the snapshot in time, you'll be able to very clearly articulate uh, when we lost resources and when we're going up in resources and the impact that, that is having in the overall crime in our city. We see this not just in our, on our city, but we see it on transit. We see this downtown and the presence of authorities, in particular police services we're talking today, make a difference and nobody should think different. 2023 was our first year of financial st stability stability and predictability since 2020 prior funding disruption and uncertainty placed us in a precarious position while trying to address immediate crime and violence issues and simultaneously as we plan for the future but i must say that stabilization has also led to increases in our recruitment and it's hitting uh, the ground running and the interesting part of that is although we've only had our funding formula since january 1 
when the province uh, invested 50 more officers earlier in the year, and when that stabilized funding was actually decided in the last quarter, we were allowed to plan and get back to the old plans that we originally had, which are also seeing results. Um, 2024 will be about our emergent crime management plan, enhanced resources for our guns and gangs teams, and growing commitment partnerships with our right partners to tackle the levels of violence plaguing Edmonton. But while P EPS does its part, accountability from our justice system is also critical to keeping violent repeat offenders off our streets and jails where they belong. We spoke about that, we spoke about bail reform, and it's an absolute must that we continue to push this and hold those who choose to hurt other people in our city accountable for their actions and their crimes. In the meantime, uh, Edmonton has seen violent incidents stabilize. We saw a much uh, a smaller increase in, uh, of 6.6% in 2023 compared to previous years. As I mentioned, this is the level of violence within a call. Superintendent McIntyre will talk about how certain things score higher than the others, such as homicide would obviously score more than a, a common assault, for instance. So I'm going to turn things over to Derek now, as Superintendent Derek McIntyre will run you through some of the data, and we'll obviously be around and open for questions, and we'll get into some discussion and dialogue. But again, I just want to reiterate and thank you for being here. And uh, Derek, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. So we'll dive right into the data, and we'll we'll start with the very promising news that we've had a 7.2% reduction in crime in the city of Edmonton between 2022 and 2023. And what this graph is gonna show you further is that when we look all the way back to 2018 to current day that we've had a significant drop of 28% in relation to the crime rate in Edmonton. And we find that our efforts that we continue to focus on and drive towards will continue to drive this crime rate down. One thing that we are very mindful of and very keenly focused on as well is that though we've had a significant drop in the rate of crime in Edmonton, that we're monitoring the fact that we've had an increase in the severity of crime. With a 4.6% increase in severity, <clears throat> though, as you can tell from the graph, that violent offenses that occur in Edmonton are, are a very small portion of the overall crime, that with a 4.6% increase in severity, that those events are becoming more and more serious. And we see that the severity increases when we start compounding the fact when weapons become present or involved in a violent crime, that also increases the severity of that event. Moving on to the total number of, of incidents, the total number of criminal incidents has decreased. Not unlike the crime rate, 7.2% reduction in the crimes. However, we also have a 6.6% increase of those criminal incidents being violence. And that's where we're focusing in 2024 in relation to our guns and gang strategy, in relation to our crime plan, is we're gonna be dialing into the locations that are really high in acuity for violence. We're gonna be focusing on offenders who commit frequent acts of violence, who recidivate in relation to violent, violent offenses, <coughs> presence and use of weapons. And that is gonna become our focus and our driving actions in 2024. This what you're seeing now is a constellation of all three different weapon types that we monitor and submit to Stats Canada. So the three weapon types that we, we track are edged weapons or knives, caustic spray, which is more commonly known as bear spray or pepper spray, and firearms. And as you can see, one of the most driving weapon types that is used is either present or used in the commission of offense is the presence or use of caustic spray. We've had a, a staggering increase in relation to the presence and the use of caustic spray. So we're really advocating for different mechanisms legislatively in order to, to manage that and to control that uh, so that we can see that number come down. Because every data point that you see on this graph in relation to the presence or use of a weapon, there's a victim on the other end of that. And we're very mindful of that as an organization. And we need to see these, these numbers come down through a collective effort. As the chief had mentioned, where we focus is where we're able to win. With our stabilized funding and our focus in relation to our transit teams through the investment from the government of Alberta, the one area where we focused in 2023 where seeing amazing dividends is in our transit system. The one area of, this, of the city where we have seen both violent criminal incidents, the presence and use of weapons and crime severity go down is in relation to transit. And I think that is in, in a strong way part of the effort and the concentration of the EPS in order to place teams in the immediate term. We have teams operating on transit 
uh, currently, and these are the results that we're seeing in relation to how we're able to manage violence, how we're able to manage violent offenders, and how we're able to manage the presence of weapons on transit. Another area where we're focusing, what you're seeing here, I know it's a very busy graph, is these are the key downtown neighborhoods that are the areas within which the Healthy Streets Operations <coughs> Center works. And we're seeing very promising results in relation to the data. Again, where we focus, we, 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 we win as an organization. We're seeing not only reductions in disorder, not only seeing better connections in relation to service delivery for disorder, we're also seeing reductions in violence in these core neighborhoods downtown. And if these results can be achieved through focus and attention in the downtown core, through programs like our Healthy Streets Operations Center, we have a really strong expectation that we will expand this out across the city as we implement our citywide crime plan in 2024. So looking forward as you've articulated and where we're seeing success, I think there's some real things that we need to focus on in 24, which is obviously moving forward with our crime management plan and that's to get the right resources in the right place at the right time, not only to deter and prevent crime, but also to hold those that are committing the offenses uh, accountable. We've put a considerable amount of work in our data uh, in relation to doing this, and I think we're in a good place to ensure it's the right people, right place, right time. So that that's first and foremost. I, I said in my statement that, uh, and, I, and I just want to really echo this, uh, because, you know, it's easy for one to pass the buck on the other, but I, I think we've presented a lot of time, and, you know, pre-C48, uh, you know, we had, or C75, sorry, we had... Uh, three homicides with people out in conditions. And I think the last time we looked, it was, you know, roughly 30 over the same period of time. We need to ensure that we keep pushing the ability to have bail reform, to making sure those that are actually most harmful to our community, based on previous actions, based on data, are those that are used uh, and held accountable by the justice system. And I think we got to continue to relentlessly pursue that. The other thing that I think we've really seen here and as you look at the timelines in those graphs is the need for the same level of investment from all levels of government and partners. I think that stabilization, you know, just to be bluntly honest, and you've heard me say it, uh, this whole defund, detask, and every other word that was used in certainly our city and other cities has not worked anywhere. And we need to move away from that and we need to make smart investment and ensure that we, with our police commission and, and, and our funding partners are doing that in a way that makes a difference for Edmontonians. And I think these results and being able to plan earlier in the year and get on with the course of action that needs to be done speaks to that in volume. So with that said, those are some of the things that we are going to be focused on. But, you know, Derek and I are both here to answer questions. Uh, those are pretty busy graphs, as you mentioned, and I'm sure you will have some questions. Hi, Chief. Um, that's a good segue. I might start with a question about funding. You've talked about police funding a lot. And I'm just wondering, is it your position that if police funding goes up, crime will go down and vice versa? Or is uh, that an oversimplification of what you're saying? Uh, well, what, what I'm showing you here is, is we got the right resources. And, and I don't think it's always as it goes up, it comes down. I think it's about how we use those resources but you also have to have an, enough resources. And if you remember a couple of years ago when we talked about this, we said we had to make the perimeter strong and then we have to go after the hot zones and we need to go after them. And then the tragic events at Chinatown and you know, obviously to deploy resources downtown, weaken us on the exterior and things moved around. But with that said is what I can clearly articulate is stable funding, the ability to plan and not changing mid-year and through different points of the year makes a huge difference to make the appropriate investments to do smart, not just enforcement, but smart prevention intervention and also allows us to be partners at the table with the right people that we have in relation to the Navigation Centre and many more. So I think what you've seen here isn't me stating, you've actually seen it in our graphs that it's actually working. We just need to make sure, we always got to look at that and evaluate that. Everybody knows that, you know, we have to be fiscally responsible and certainly I think we've uh, uh, have done that for the last uh, several years actually. You did seem, this is kind of the other side of the same coin, but I mean, you seem to say the removal of the funding formula 
impacted on EPS's ability to do its well, job. Well, did that contribute to the? Well, hundred percent. We shut down we recruiting classes. We went short on patrols. We went short on shifts, which takes away your lack of visibility in relation to how you solve crime. So. You know, policing is still a human uh, service or a human uh, thing that uses a lot of human resources. So I can do, say very comfortably that COVID-19, the funding, the destabilization, the events of Minneapolis absolutely had an impact on the negative events that we've seen. And what I've seen now is with that stabilization, the ability to get back to planning appropriately, making smart investments, it makes a difference. I'm not saying it's just a blank check, and I want to be very, very clear. What I'm saying is it's about smart investment, and it's about delivering adequate and effective policing, which is the responsibility of the province, and it's funded by the city. So, I mean, when you look at that, you have to justify what you're using and what you're doing. Uh, which leads to another question, because I think you're you're on to something there. I don't know how many times I've been asked lately, uh, how come you don't open this audit? And, you know, you guys have reported on everything. I think we're missing the point here. The police service has had an audit unit for several years. In 2019, we did a national uh, search to find a very, very qualified, high-credential auditor who has a total of six staff, and we audit, audit a minimum of seven things per year for our police commission, which reports directly to our police commission, and then we get further audited by the province in relation to use of force and other things. I'm not sure why we would do redundant audit, audits that you know have certainly been mentioned by certain components uh, uh, of elected officials in the city, the reality is I think they've got enough work. This is the lane of the police commission and government, and we are absolutely open to that. But, you know, the reality is we audit things that matter, and we do it all the time to ensure that we have, as you mentioned, using our resources to adequately and effectively uh, deliver policing. That's the benchmark. It's in the Police Act. It's in legislation. And we can't get away from that because when we get away from that and get into public opinion, we go in the wrong direction. Stands. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm maybe monopolizing here, but do you do you see some of like why there might be a public appetite to, to see what's being done, or do you think that's superfluous? There, 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 no, no. We do that. We do it at a commission. You know, the point is, there's a process in place, and I think people need to understand that. Council up to lately, and now the province has three. They appoint police commissioners to represent them. That's not in every area. Those commissioners, and if anybody's ever looked. On our commission, you have two doctors, you have a lawyer, you have an accountant, you have indigenous representation, minority representation. You have a very strong police commission. In fact, I've said it often, it's probably one of the strongest commissions I've ever seen in this country. They're doing their job, let them do their job. You also have a province that audits further on certain things. But when you say public appetite, I'm not sure that's what's not being satisfied. I think it's just trying to make a story about something that's already been looked at. And the question is, do you want to reduce crime or do you just want to continue to audit things when we've already, already audited them? Uh, looking at the numbers generally, you have uh, you basically have general incidents, you have violent incidents, and then you have you know a bunch of data there, but nothing related to uh, drugs. So, like when we're talking about violent incidents, how much of that is related to drug use, drug movement, um, any type of gang activity, that sort of thing? Yeah, and, and I mean we can break that out further, but I mean I I think you've heard us say in the past when these are our aggregate uh, obviously stats, but when we actually break it out. We know very well that, you know, organized crimes and gangs, uh, you know, in the illicit drug trade, I mean, was rampant in our encampments. You, you take them down, you take the opportunity away, and guess what? Things come down. It's not how many people you arrest, but if you look at some of the uh, uh, infiltration and things that we've done in relation to alert, in relation to our guns and gangs team and some of the charges we've laid, it all plays an impact. So what I would say to that is... Uh, uh, addictions play a significant part in a lot of our work and we've said that many many times what also plays a, a role is the violence and the criminal activity and the organized crime because they're in behind most of the drugs at some point but what I can also say the feeder system to that is antisocial behavior people that obviously have addictions issues and what you've seen us do and when we use the words empathy and accountability is we need to address both of those violence and those people that are committing these acts that are doing it over and over and they keep getting out 
are different than those that are stuck with addiction and they're trying to, you know, they're struggling with whatever things, trauma and whatever things they're dealing with, we have to address both of these. Because if we don't address the feeder system, we never have enough resources to address this. But at the same time, if we don't have accountability into this system, it all falls apart and one plus one equal three in a negative direction. Further to that is when we did a study when I was a deputy minister, is when you put uh, low risk people in jail with high risk people, they all become high risk, so you artificially increase your crime rate. This is why the training that we put into our frontline officers to give them the ability to determine those calls for service, who needs a health intervention or some type of other intervention, PACT, HELP, Navigation Center needs to be in place because if the only option is the justice system, we're actually gonna artificially increase it. When you separate that, things come down quickly and that's what we've been focused on. We are doing also a tremendous amount of work in relation to those people that choose to uh, basically um, uh, create violence in our city. And in a prime example, as you've heard DC LaForce is, the fires and the arsons and, and, and all those things are going. We are well on our way. We will hold people accountable. That's what we do. But at the same time, you can't just focus on that. You know, you, you, you talked about it, and Johnny was talking about on, on it earlier is, you know, when we talked about funding, when I talk about right funding for right things, we're all aware that a lot of the money in our budget wasn't just reduced, it was given to other things that obviously didn't positively impact our crime rate. So we're not here fighting for money, what we're doing is fighting for the fact that we gotta continue doing the right things, and to your point, if we don't get a better mental health and addiction system, which the province is committed to, there's never gonna be enough resources and human and financial to address this. So that's why we're trying to obviously have a balanced approach, which is one of our pillars in our strategic plan. Uh, we also saw a lengthy chart there showing that the, you know, the crime rates in downtown are majority of the violent crimes that are happening center, in the center core of the city, or is it across the whole city that you're seeing that increase? Across the whole city, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. This might be for Superintendent McIntyre, only because he brought it up, so maybe you've Sounds both got right. a comment on it, yeah. but it was the, I think the stat that you specifically brought up about the caustic substances. Yes. Can you unpack that a little bit more? We were here a couple of weeks ago about trying to get knives banned in corner stores, so I want to hear more about how much of this you're seeing with the caustic substances. Well, I can actually bring up that again, if you'd like. And it is quite concerning. So if you look at the, the highest number, 1,000, we've had 1,000 incidents, and it's uh, across all three weapon types, it's, it's a 9% increase in the presence or use of weapons. When we talk about violent crimes being committed and the use or presence of a weapon, 1,000 times it was caustic spray or pepper spray. We're on the doorstep of being, being able to really try to manage that better. The standalone bear spray bylaw has now been folded into the public spaces bylaw. And we're very anxiously waiting as a police service for the debate to occur at council for this bylaw to be passed because that is going to help us manage and limit the presence and the use of bear spray because it does then fall within a piece of legislation. Right now you'd think, well, if someone uses bear spray, that's, that's a criminal event, and it is. But someone having bear spray in their backpack in a public space is not a criminal offense because it's not being used as a weapon. The bylaw will instill that in the public spaces in Edmonton, you are not allowed to possess bear spray that doesn't have the original manufacturer safety seal still on it. So if it's been activated, not unlike a fire extinguisher, if the pin's been pulled, it then becomes unlawful to possess it in a public space in Edmonton. And we're very anxiously waiting for that to happen, Dave. Forgive me if I've missed it in the past, but with these uh, knives at the corner stores, this was a uh concerns about point of purchase, right? So is there anything in the works with regard to that, with the caustic sprays? The, well, the, the stores that sell caustic spray sell them legally. They're allowed, you're allowed to sell caustic As spray. As do the corner stores with knives. Exactly. The thing about the caustic spray is when they're sold, they're sold in a way where they have a manufacturer seal on them. It's the removal of the seal in the new bylaw that will make them unlawful. Uh, this is for the chief again. It's sort of to my previous point, but I'm just wondering, whenever we talk about crime statistics, 
obviously police will say policing has helped these go down or lack of policing has helped them go up. But I'm just wondering how much do you think policing is responsible for these changes we see? For example, like I, I it would, might be because uh, an officer was there to deter a crime or it might have gone down because so, of bad weather yeah, or some totally well, different factor. I, I actually wouldn't ask the question like that if I was asking a question from a data point is, I would say community safety is the responsibility of the community. And I would say that our partnerships with help and PAC with some of our service providers are slowing down our intake. I would say the navigation center has a place to take people. I would say the violence and stuff, won't, we're owning that. But the reality is, is this is the misnomer that everybody talks about trying to say it's weather in this. You know, there's no evidence about that. The reality is, is if you don't do both at the same time, and you have a feeder system to crime, which is what we had in Edmonton, which we had drastically running around encampment, which now when you see the data in the encampments, it's nowhere near what we thought it was in relation to the number of people. Now, everybody said that we have this massive homeless problem here. We're talking maybe 1,500 people. We're probably seeing two to 400 that are chronically ill, some type of an addiction. They need to be addressed through a health system. You're seeing growing numbers in shelters that are largely due uh, to our immigrant population. They're different solutions. This one is led by you know, rental subsidies, affordable housing, uh, you know, and the list goes on. In the middle, you need a recovery-orientated system to deal with those struggling with addictions, a place to take people, and in the end, you need the ability to hold people accountable. The problem with that question is it's a compartmentalizing it, and the problem is it's not to blame others. The reality is it's to get everybody going in the same direction, and I think that's the responsibility of the police, and that's the role we've been playing. Right, sorry, can you expand on, you said there's something about the numbers in encampments weren't anywhere what you were thinking they were in total number of people or what were you referring no, to? No, the, the encampment numbers were large, and but there was a lot of people that were coming and going in relation to those encampments. When you don't allow them to happen, you no longer have a lot of the social disorder. What I was pleasantly surprised about in relation to that is the majority of people took services, the majority of them, and the majority of them were connected. And then you've got people out there saying, oh, we're just moving them around. That's not the case at all. Statistics and data don't show that. Going back to the data, uh, I'm kind of picking back off Dave here. The, the sprays have gone up. How many instances did you see both a spray and a knife at the same time or a spray and a gun at the same time? Like, is that data just individual cases or were there doubling up kind of thing? It's, that's a really good question. So the way that we report this data is we categorize it as the most serious offense in relation to the event. So when you see caustic spray, that's the most serious. So I think, you know, a cascading effect in relation to severity would be presence or use of a firearm, presence or use of a knife, and then presence or use of caustic spray, because the two other ones, the knife and the firearm, uh, people a homicide could be completed using those two things. Very, very low likelihood that someone would die from exposure to caustic spray. Any other questions? Yeah, and further, further to that one more time, are we able to find out what you're attributing that massive increase to for the caustic spray? The use of the caustic is yeah. highly accessible, way more accessible in relation to uh, availability than firearms are. And I think in relation to a, a slight level of deterrence if someone is going to arm themselves with something and they're contemplating what the outcome of being caught with it is, the difference between being caught with pepper spray and a knife or a firearm are very different from each other. So not only is it cheaper and more accessible, there's less deterrence in relation to caustic spray and there's a lot less consequence in relation to the possession of it. Because right now, there is no consequence to possess caustic spray. Okay, and just to follow to that, so it became much more available in 2023? Or, or not much the more available. Or, so or, the, or large, the rationale for having that as opposed to another weapon became kind much of the, more... the personal choice of the person who's choosing to arm themselves. So it's not a supply chain issue about availability. I think it's around the choices that people are making in relation to what level of arming themselves they want to do and then use.